Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and get started today. I just wanted to take a second and thank you for joining in. This is our second segment of the table, which is a virtual call series. Um, we started it to kind of help you, our incredible partners, get to know more about our organization and give you an opportunity to connect with uh, Michael Ledger, our new president and CEO, and some of our other managers and leadership of the organization. So we're very excited you're here today. Um, just to give you an overview. We will be focusing on Hurricane Sally response. Um, our organization has been responding for about the past month. And so Michael will take a few minutes to really kind of go over what that looked like from the beginning and how that process has adapted and changed and um, just the areas and the impact we're, we're serving. nutrition director um, and she will focus on kind of the importance of our child nutrition programs and how we have responded throughout the year to COVID-19 um, and how kids have been able to still get help with school closures and things like that. So at this time I would also like to ask that if you have any questions you can use the Q&A box down in the corner of your screen and we will be watching those as um, throughout the presentation and responding some by text just to ensure we can get to all of them. But we'll also be answering some questions at the end with Michael and Eugenie. So if you have any questions or you think of anything, just put it in that Q&A box and we'll get to it at the end. All right, at this time, I'm gonna open it up and let Michael talk. Hello, everyone. Uh, I wanna thank you uh, for joining us at the table today. I'm um, looking forward to telling you a little bit about what we've been doing here at Being the Gulf Coast. Um, I think one of the exciting parts about this, uh, this program, as we put it together, is that we are going to be uh, highlighting different areas of this organization. Um, I think, interestingly, about this particular food bank, uh, Feeding the Gulf Coast, we do a lot of different things. Um, I, I think we're in just about every program you can be in. Um, some, some food banks do uh, focus on certain areas, others are uh, diversified. I, I would say we definitely fit in the latter. We're very diversified. Uh, today, um, as she mentioned, uh, we're gonna be talking about our child nutrition program. The uh, impact of that program is, is it's really just amazing. And I'm looking so forward to, to Eugenie having an opportunity to tell us about it, the impact it makes in our community uh, and for the children uh, of our community. Um, uh, it, it's certainly something we take uh, and are so proud of. So I can't wait to hear uh, have, have her tell us all about it. Um, so what I'm tasked with today is talking specifically about our response to Hur Hurricane Sally. Um, so the uh, hurricane hit September 16th, um, and we had certain areas of our of, um, of our 24 counties that were particularly impacted. Uh, some to lesser degrees that they definitely had impact, but the the three or four counties that really got hit. Uh, sort of in the bullseye of it was Baldwin County in Alabama, uh, Escambia County in Florida, and Escambia County in Alabama, and then uh, Mobile County in Alabama. Uh, and we've been really focused in those counties, uh, working to try to, to, to make sure that we're, we're responding to the need. Um, so we had been meeting months prior uh, on our disaster program. So we have a, 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 a long list of things that make up our disaster program and we decided it had been a time for a, a full review of that. So our team got together and this is made up of a lot of folks from a lot of different areas within the, uh, within the organization that you might not initially think of as, as disaster related. But it turns out when you really start to dig into it, um, nearly every aspect of our organization has a hand in our disaster response. So um, I was really pleased that we had taken the time to review our disaster plan. We're still reviewing it. We're still making amendments to it. And every time we have an event like this, uh, we're making a list um, of things that could be changed. I know uh, Cindy Bloom, our uh, new director of operations, has a, has a long list of things that we're gonna be getting together to talk about that we might want to uh, incorporate or change or update within our, within our disaster plan. So we started meeting days before the event. Uh, we were having daily meetings. Uh, to try to prepare. Of course, you can only prepare so much for a hurricane. Um, they have a mind of their own. And as we all know, this thing shifted to the east. So we thought uh, uh, we were gonna be activating, particularly to the uh, western part of our region, 
uh, through Mississippi and maybe uh, the western part of our Alabama service area. Turns out it's, it's, it switched on us uh, in places um, like Baldwin, uh, Santa Rosa County, uh, uh, Navarre Beach, et cetera, got, got hit. Um, we had pulled everyone off the road as the event was unfolding, but the next day, as soon as it was safe to get back out, we, we were working to get trucks out on the road to respond. Uh, we had power outages at both warehouses and we have large freezers, large coolers um, with you know, tens of thousands of pounds of food in, in them. And uh, when we lost power, fortunately, our generators kicked in, um, but generators need fuel. Um, and we were having a hard time with that. Fortunately, the state activated in Florida and actually dispatched a truck from Tallahassee. Um, and I think I mentioned that story because uh, took coordination to make that happen. And, and, and a great thanks to the state and our partners who helped make that happen. But I also think it speaks to the importance of our mission they understand that it's critical that we're able to go out and support folks that, that are in need, uh, that uh, have lost everything perhaps, and, and don't know where they're gonna get their next meal. Um, so uh, we were very thankful for that support. Uh, and 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 I, I think it really uh, reinforces the message that, that what we do is very valued. Um, here in Alabama, we lost power and our generator went down. So we had just hours to respond to that, to figure out how to get them back up. Fortunately, our coolers and freezers are built to hold temperature for, for a, a certain amount of time. Um, we were on the phone with the state, the counties, trying to figure out how to get that fixed. Um, ended up uh, a company we didn't think even worked on them were, was able to find the part and get us back up and running. So this was happening throughout the night, through all night long, trying to make sure that we were figuring out a way to get power restored here to save our food and to make sure we can continue with our mission. Uh, so we had trucks out the next day, uh, at the same time, we were communicating with our partners. Uh, we were communicating with Feeding America. We were communicating with state agencies, uh, with county agencies, BOAD, uh, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of communication that goes into this, uh, and our, um, development and, uh, uh, development team were putting together messages such as the ones you see in front of us. We wanted to make sure that we were letting everyone in our service area know what was going on, what we were trying to do to, to respond to it, and also, uh, if you uh, chose to, how you might be able to help us do that. Uh, we were, our agency relations department was on the phone and communicating uh, via many methods to see how our agencies in these areas had been affected. Uh, can we, could we support them? Could we help them? Uh, could they help us? Were they, were they in a position where they could start to respond to the event? Um, and that allowed us operationally to understand where we could put food uh, and, and where we couldn't. And, and, and if we couldn't, then what were our alternatives? Um, we started to partner through the state and county agencies. We were taking food out to sites, running our own mobile pantries. But more than that, our, our agency partners were doing it, both at their brick and mortar, but also in parking lots, wherever they could to put up mobile pantries. Um, to reinforce all of this, we actually started to take and make food drops at uh, the uh, state controlled pod sites. They were called pod sites where they were delivering different kinds of uh, necessities to folks that, that were affected by the uh, storm. And again, uh, we, we started to partner with that, use those people and those sites to, to, as another front for putting food out. Uh, during this time, uh, the state had reached out to our uh, SNAP outreach department. I say we're in a lot of different things and upcoming table, you'll be uh, learning more about our SNAP outreach department. Um, they were contacted to help uh, with uh, DSNAP applications. Um, to date, they've taken over 1400 calls and this was out of three counties in Alabama. Uh, first it was uh, Baldwin and Escambia and they had a five day window. And as that window closed, Mobile County's DSNAP uh, program opened up uh, and again they've been taking calls for that the past week. Those uh, 1,400 calls approximately have resulted in uh, over 800 SNAP pre-screening forms being completed. Uh, we're really proud of that and that's another thing I, I, I love about this organization, the diversity of the things we do and when it comes time to respond to a crisis such as this, um, we have all kinds of different levers that we can pull to help uh, hopefully provide 
provide a solution to those in need. Uh, and I think the DSNAP is a great place to talk about the fact that something like Sally happens and it's in the news and there's a lot of activity and, and, a, and a lot of press and, 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 and response. Uh, the problem is for folks in the, that are really impacted by a storm like this, um, it goes on. Uh, there's still roofs that, are, that need to be tarped, roofs that need to be repaired, trees that are down, uh, homes that have, you know, were flooded to the point where they're uninhabitable until, until uh, more work's been done. And of course, their lives are impacted every day. Uh, we can't forget that. So we are continuing to respond to this event. Um, since the event happened, uh, we have distributed over a half million pounds of food in Baldwin County uh, for a 350% increase. We've uh, put in about 150,000 pounds in the Scania County floor, uh, excuse me, Alabama, 363% uh, increase year over year. Uh, in Florida, uh, we put in over 600,000 pounds um, with 30 mobile pantries there. Uh, in total, we put out 1.8 million pounds of food since landfall. Uh, and again, we here, uh, where these, uh, where it was most hit, that the need is con uh, perhaps even increasing. At a minimum, it's sustaining. Uh, so this event will not end for us. Uh, even Hurricane Michael now, a few years old, we still, we still work with them. There's still ongoing uh, uh, work to recover from that storm, and that's been two years ago. Fortunately, I don't think Sally in total was quite as destructive, but if you were one of the people that, uh, that uh, as these pictures illustrate, um, w took it uh, very hard, obviously your life is gonna be impacted uh, as just as long as Hurricane Michael. Uh, we're talking about supporting for the long haul. We have partner agencies that, that stood up um, and activated other agencies helped to get them on board, helped to get them running again. So agencies helping agencies. And these are, these are teams of people that are invested. They give every day of themselves. Um, they make their resources available to us. And without them, we couldn't do the work that we do. And I, we just can't say enough about what they do. And we're so happy to be supporting them any way we can. Uh, we have used food sourcing uh, we had food come from uh, trucks that came from Feeding America. They responded with emergency food boxes. Uh, we had offers from even food banks in Louisiana who had their own difficulties with hurricanes this season. Uh, Feeding Florida, uh, the Florida State had sent us uh, MREs. I believe we completed over 10 state missions for them, uh, putting MREs at site as the state dictated. So uh, we have uh, tried to respond to, to all requests in any way we can, and we intend to continue to do so uh, throughout this uh, ordeal. Of course, COVID persists on top of all of this. As I've said recently, um, COVID has made everybody just a little bit more vulnerable. And when you have an event like Sally, um, what becomes a concern could become critical. And for those folks that, that had already found themselves in a critical position, uh, it, it's even more precarious. Uh, so we're dedicated to trying to continue to support them and, uh, and make sure that uh, we're addressing their uh, food insecurity whenever and however we can. Um, I believe that concludes my Hurricane Sally update. I think uniquely for a child, there's certain age points where if, if the nourishment is not there for them, uh, their development is stunted, perhaps stunted permanently. Um, so we take child nutrition incredibly seriously. Uh, we we, we, we want to know that every day uh, a child has the nutrition they need to carry on and hopefully have a happy, a happy life. Um, and I know Eugenie takes the mission very seriously and I'm going to turn it over to her on that.
Every year, millions of working American families and their children hide their struggle with hunger. But just because you can't see it, doesn't mean it's not there. With over 72 billion pounds of food going to waste each year, it doesn't need to be that way. Feeding America is a network of 200 food banks, 60,000 food pantries, and 2 million volunteers. We work with farmers, retailers, and manufacturers to get people the food they need. Hunger hides, but we can help. Let's end hunger in America. Yes, thank you all for hosting me. I am Eugenie Sellier. I'm our Director of Child Nutrition Programs here at Feeding the Gulf Coast. Um, with that was a very touching video. I think one of the things that we've noticed, especially in the pandemic, is prior to this, hunger was a little bit more hidden. And now with the pandemic, um, it's more visible. We see on the television where there are, you know, lines of, of cars waiting at distributions to receive meals. And it's, it's something that is becoming more vivid and more aware. Um, and one of the things that we've worked to focus on is, is feeding kids. So looking at um, child food insecurity, currently one in three children are considered food insecure. So whenever you're thinking, um, what does food insecure mean? So children do not have access to nutritious food on a regular basis. Uh, in our service area, that's almost 162,000. I will say prior to the pandemic, it was actually one in four kids. So we have seen an increase since the pandemic started uh, of more children being in food insecure. And, and you can see this um, just within the access, you know, with, with some schools closing and even having transportation issues of children and parents being able to go to schools to pick up meals, a lot of them don't always have that privilege, so they're not able to make that trek to the school. So we have seen an increase in food insecurity. As Michael touched on a little bit, um, children who do face hunger have can have long-term issues. So you may they may have lower grades in school. They may even have to repeat a grade. Uh, they, they can have long-term developmental impairments, which could include um, language issues, motor skills, um, even behavioral issues. One of the things that we work to do in our programs is we actually use a student referral form for our backpack program to educate our, our teachers and counselors who may not see what hunger looks like, because it doesn't always look the same. It's not like it's going to look like in other parts of the world, um, especially in, in our country. You may see children who are rushing to food lines in, the, in a school day. They may hurry up and eat their food and then ask for seconds. Um, on Monday mornings, they're coming into school and they're extremely hungry. Uh, you know, as soon as they get into the classroom, they may have trouble focusing until, until a, a teacher may even have to give them um, a snack. I know a lot of teachers keep snacks in their desk drawers to help kids um, subside their hunger and, and help them focus on their, on their schoolwork. Um, if children are regularly asking teachers for food, if they're saving or hoarding food, or even taking it home, and some children um, will even let you know their home status and say, we, we don't have enough food at home. And, and some other ways that um, you can see this is in their school performance. If, if children are chronically sick, they're, they're missing school, they have higher absent rates, uh, they have to repeat a grade. Um, if they're extremely tardy, if they have chronic behavioral issues, um, or even if they have short attention spans. And with, with these issues become the bigger issues of their education, right, and, and their, their development. So we want to make sure, um, especially in our programs, that we're building strong, healthy kids so that they can um, be a functioning adult in society. They don't have to worry about nutrition because that's something, you know, none of us would, would want to worry about. So going in... Um, and talking a little bit about how, how we address uh, child food insecurity in, in our programs. So all of our programs work to provide access to nutritious meals outside of school hours. So we work on doing that through after school, through serving meals on the weekends, through serving meals um, during holidays and summer breaks to make sure, even though children may not physically be in school, uh, to have access to a meal, they can still have access to one when they're not in school. Um, our first program is our after school meals program. So this program um, coincides with, with regular school schedule. So from August to May, we work to provide um, 
regular snacks and meals um, at no cost through the USDA to, to children um, that may be enrolled in an enrichment program at an after school boys and girls club, maybe a tutoring program, YMCA, um, even at a school. So those kids that are enrolled in those programs, we like to be able to provide them with a no cost snack, which consists of a carton of juice and a whole grain, um, such as like whole grain goldfish that we like to give them just to make sure that they have something in their tummy so they can continue to um, engage in, in their enrichment. So that could be doing their homework or, um, or even, you know, some of the recreational activities kids do after school hours just to keep them full and to supper. Uh, we also provide meals through this program as well. So our meals that we provide are very similar to what you may see in a school cafeteria. Um, it's going to have um, a protein, a grain, a fruit, a vegetable, a milk. So it's very similar to a, a school cafeteria lunch and we work to provide these for kids who may not have suppers when they go home at night. So we work with very similar locations that are providing after school enrichment where kids are gathering to provide them with a meal before they leave and head home for the day. Our next program that operates during the school year is our backpack program. Um, this one is usually what most people are familiar with. I will say that uh, it's not necessarily a backpack, it's actually a bag of food that we put inside the backpacks. So what this program does is we work to provide children with nutritious, easy to prepare items for the weekend. So when they're not in school, we wanna make sure that um, on Saturday and Sundays, they have access to a breakfast, a lunch, uh, a dinner item, a snack item, to where they're not coming to school hungry on Mondays. Um, and it can also help them engage further on the weekends and, and weekend activities. So our backpacks um, contain six me meal items and two snack items. Um, a lot of the food, as mentioned, is easy preparable. So it's a lot of it's pop top meals like Chef Boyardee, raviolis and um, mac and cheese, uh, cereal bowls, things like that, that kids um, don't necessarily need supervision to eat and prepare. Uh, most of our food bags weigh about four pounds and they're put into their bags on Fridays before they head home. So whenever we are working with us with a school to start this program, we work directly with the teachers and school counselors to identify the children. So as I mentioned earlier, some of those signs of, of hunger, those are what they use to refer kids on this program. And teachers and counselors know their kids the best. So we, we really work with them on their expertise of knowing their kids and their families um, and referring them to this program. So once they identify these children, um, they will send us a number. Uh, they do not send us names. We try to keep this program as anonymous as we can because we don't, um, we, you know, we want to protect the children's privacy uh, in this program. So they send us a number of how many kids uh, they believe would be eligible for this program. And from there, they work with us uh, to, to set up the program. So we pack backpacks on site here at our facility, at our, at our different warehouses. We, we pack the backpacks and then we deliver them to the schools on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis, whichever works best for the school. And then on Fridays, the, the teachers and the counselors, uh, they have a couple of different ways that they will distribute the bags. Rather, they'll wait until the children are out of the classroom and they'll go in the classroom and put the bag of food in their backpack so other kids are not aware. Or uh, they'll call the kids to the to the office, say they're part of a special club or something like that, and call them to the office so they're able to receive a bag of food. They try to keep it as discreet as possible um, to, to not only protect their privacy, but also there's a lot of stigma um, associated with hunger. So we wanna make sure we're protecting kids as much as we can um, in these programs. Our next program is our summer meals program. So this is one of our, our largest programs uh, that we operate. It's very, in a, in a normal summer, it's very, it's a lot of meals in a short amount of time. So during this program, um, we operate it from May through August when school is out of session. So is, so pretty much what we've worked to do is, is really have wraparound service in our program or year-round service in our program. So as soon as kids are, as soon as our sites, our partners are ending their after school and backpack program on a, on a Friday when school ends, on that following Monday, we're turning it 
turning and burning into our summer feeding program um, and, and keeping it rolling to make sure that, that children don't lose access. Uh, so for our summer feeding program, uh, we, we work with locations to distribute meals at, at no cost to children um, who are 18 years of age and younger. Uh, this, this program is, is in partnership with the USDA as well. And kids can get up to two no-cost meals. So we provide breakfast, lunch, and snack. And, and it's up to our partner locations to choose which meals they would like and, and when they would like to serve them. Um, we do uh, generally for our lunches, we try to make sure they're, they're packed fresh. So whether we're doing a cold lunch, like a bag lunch, or um, outside of the pandemic, we would normally be doing hot meals. So, or we're doing a hot lunch for the kids. Uh, we wanna, we try to really work to make sure we're giving them meals that that they enjoy, that they love to eat. Uh, we, we survey them to <laughs> make sure our menus are meeting their expectations as well as, um, you know, the USDA's expectations of having our, our required meal patterns. So again, with these meals, they're very similar to what you see in a cafeteria as well. They're gonna have your grain, your protein. So um, it could be a, an incrustable and a fresh fruit, a fresh, fresh vegetable and a, um, a carton of milk. So we we definitely work to provide that for them during the summer when they don't they may not have access uh, to those meals that they would normally be getting in a school environment. So our our newest one of our newer programs is our school pantry program. Um, this program it works very similar to a a pantry what you would may see at a church or a fellow nonprofit organization uh, we primarily work to start our school pantry program because we've seen that by through our backpack program that a lot of times when we're working with teenagers um, so we're working with students in middle school and high school they're they're not always willing to accept a bag of food just because of the stigma that's associated with it uh, so one of the things we really wanted to set up especially um, because a lot of times teenagers want to take um, responsibility and do things on their own. We really wanted to work to provide them with the same kind of choices. So we set up a school pantry within a school environment. So in a high school or a middle school where teenagers or students can go in and they can choose the food they want. Um, they can pick as many items as they want, depending on their household. So they can even get extra food if they like for a sibling. And one of the ways that we we try to incentivize them to a, to go to a pantry is by having non-food items in there such as hygienic items office supply items um, things like that so that they're a little bit more incentivized to go um, this program we have been piloting for about two years now um, it's it's really worked uh, well with with not only providing for the the students the teenage students but also their siblings um, and, and I will say we try to make sure their food is easy preparable too. So it's very similar items to what you may see in a backpack. We try to get larger sized items or we try to give them more because generally teenagers eat more food. So we try to give them a little bit extra to make sure they have that. Uh, many, many schools set it up um, a little bit different in our backpack program. We try to make sure uh, we have a flexible model with, with this program to where it is set up in a counselor's office or in a, in a utility closet or, or even near the school nurse's office, something like that, to where the students can easily come in, grab their food, and head out. Um, some of them will set it up closer to where they're dismissing students so they can easily head in and head out. Um, in some cases, we're able to provide them with uh, like drawstring bags so they can keep the food a little bit more discreet. In other cases, um, they, they're just putting it directly in their book bag. So we've had really good success with this program so far, so we're really excited to continue it and expand it as we move forward to help con continue to serve not just, you know, our elementary kids, but also our teenagers who are, who are suffering with food insecurity. Um, our last initiative that we've worked to incorporate in our programs is our farm to school program. So with, with farm to school, um, we really focus on local procurement from farmers. Uh, we work on providing nutrition ed and agriculture education uh, to, to the students we're serving. So especially with, um, for example, what's 
the meals we serve in our kitchen. Um, very similar to how you run a cafeteria, right? We, we have to procure food for that. We have to purchase fresh fruits, vegetables um, to put in those meals. So we've worked very closely um, with some of our local farmers to procure local sweet potatoes or local satsuma season's about to start, one of my favorites. So we'll start procuring satsumas um, and we'll be able to put them in our meals. And we're not only able to show kids um, how easy it is because they're grown right here in the community, but we're able to educate them on the nutrients they get from these from these items and also on how they're grown. Because a lot of times, I didn't I didn't know how a satsuma was grown. <laughs> you know, it grows on like this this bush uh, kind of tree. So um, we're able to even educate them on how they're grown, uh, which you know really helps them appreciate our food system more. I did want to highlight that the month of October is our farm to school month. So right now. Um, we have some initiatives going to, to definitely engage kids and students that we're serving in this program this Wednesday um, in the state of Alabama. We're celebrating Apple Crunch Day, so we've worked to procure some local apples that we'll be sending out uh, not only through our kitchen, but also on some of our regular snack delivery, deliveries so that children can get some fresh locally grown apples. Um, and then we're also able to purchase them locally so it, it helps with our local uh, farming and food system. COVID-19 has not only impacted the health of thousands across the country, it's also affecting many people's wallets. A lot of people are furloughed or let go from their jobs, so the need for assistance from food banks continues to rise. Many churches and volunteers were out today giving food for those in need. News 5's Daniel Smithson has the story. Another car drives up to this food distribution spot off of Lillian Highway. How are y'all doing? Volunteers with Crown Church are there to greet them with smiles and food for the children inside of the vehicle. This may seem small, but it's huge for some of these different families, so whatever we can do to help. Crown Church partnered with Feeding the Gulf Coast, formerly known as Bay Area Food Bank, to distribute lunches and snacks to about 100 children on Monday. Pastor Jason Oxidine believes he was called to give back during this time. So that was one of our, our sites that participated um, in our summer feeding program with us that started really early this year due to the pandemic. Uh, since with, so at the beginning, um, back in March, whenever school started closing, one of the things we had to do to continue to provide that year round service, we, we definitely like to, uh, to highlight. Um, we had to essentially switch from one program to another in a matter of days. And even though that may not look like a lot or we may do it very very smoothly to where it may not seem like a lot um, we we were very busy because it's, it's two different programs with completely different requirements and and we engaged a lot a lot more distribution sites as well so um, we had to switch from our after school program to our summer meals program so not only are we you know switching our menu items but we're also um, hiring on additional seasonal staff uh, we're, we're also creating different routes operationally. We, we have to order more food to come in because we're serving, you know, almost double the amount of meals a day as, as what we would normally be serving in a school year. So um, it's something that um, I cannot thank the staff and the team enough on. I'm only one person, but I have a, I have a, I have a staff of about 15 um, amazing dedicated individuals who who are very passionate about this work like I am and I mean without them <laughs> you know they we would not be able to make this happen um I can tell you whenever school started closing I think I believe some of them started closing on a Friday in mid in, in mid-March we were working all weekend to make sure um we were communicating not only with our state agencies. We're talking, you know, with departments of education, departments of ag. Uh, we were talking um, to the USDA. We were, we were talking with our sites, um, even some of our seasonal staff already, and our vendors to make sure we could get this program moving and off the ground uh, because we wanted to be able to provide 
children with meals during the day. And that's the biggest part of summer feeding, why, why it's really important that, that we've been able to continue it, is that even though school may still be in session with summer meals, we're able to provide meals um, during the day to kids that may be learning virtually uh, who, don't, who aren't physically going to school. Um, and, and with, you know, with this program, we were able to do grab and go meals so we can keep safety a priority. So one of the things we transitioned to was doing more cold meals um, that can be taken in a grab and go fashion. Uh, so our distribution sites were we're setting up drive through lines and handing off meals uh, to parents. There was also flexibilities with, with serving multiple days at a time. So a family could come and pick up, um, you know, a week's worth of meal at one time if they had issues with transportation. So we had a lot of flexibilities and we still do have a lot of flexibilities with this program um, because we're continuing to operate it. Uh, one of the things that uh, a big success we have is that this program has been expanded to operate through this school year. So we're, we're currently still operating a summer meals program. So we have those flexibilities and um, we can continue to, to feed as much as possible during the day. To just to add a couple things to that, you know, you're talking about feeding kids. We're, you're currently running all four programs, four of the programs simultaneously. And that's typically not the case that she was trying to to make the point on, I think that that we have kids that are back to school, but at home, but at a home that perhaps is highly food insecure. Uh, then you have kids that are actually in the school, but that also may have food insecurity. So kids are in all kinds of different spots right now. So their ability to run all of these programs simultaneously so that we can reach them, whatever their circumstance may be, is, uh, you know, tremendous effort. And as she said, uh, the team is doing great work and uh, really, really greatly appreciated. Um, you know, talking about other other things she mentioned. You know, adjusting the food. We sign off on some pretty big big invoices when it comes to the, uh, the child nutrition program, and and we'll have conversations about those, and they'll be explaining. Well, the kids don't want to eat that anymore. We're, they're on to something else. So I, I love the fact that that our program. You just can't say how much of their work there is into it. The administrative part of all these programs. On the on the what you see on the other end of it is just the food out, but the amount of work that goes into the administrative side is immense. Uh, whether that be our own internal needs and adjustments, or or uh, state or federal requirements, etc. Uh, but to be able to still balance all that and know that the kids maybe may not want a particular item anymore, we need to switch. I I think that just speaks to how invested the team is in it, and uh, and 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 the work they're willing to put into it. And then, uh, as she mentioned, uh, you know, being able to switch all these things on and off that could take weeks or months to prepare, but doing it unexpectedly in a matter of a week or two, uh, just amazing effort and, and greatly appreciated. Um, and I wanted to say on the behalf of the entire team, you know, the work that we're putting into Sally, the work they're putting into COVID, um, it's, uh, it, it's tremendous effort and uh, I, I never want to, never not say the fact that I greatly appreciate everyone's effort and, uh, and I'm counting on it going forward as we continue to help those in need. Thank you both for your time. Um, just to reiterate, if you have any questions, now is a great time to go ahead and put those into the box. Um, I'm gonna go through a few more slides, just giving you some general information so you have about one to two minutes and we'll start answering those. If you know anybody that is in need of help, whether it's a child who needs a child nutrition site or somebody who's been impacted by Hurricane Sally or just somebody who's in general need for food assistance, um, we always encourage people to visit our website, feedingthegulfcoast.org. We have a find help tab um, and there you can find information on how to sign up for those SNAP benefits that Michael mentioned earlier. There's some other resources for senior citizens. We have um, a find a pantry um, kind of interactive map that you can put in your address and it'll actually, you can indicate if you need a senior center, if you need a child nutrition meal or a distribution or a pantry or a soup kitchen. And with your SIP code, it'll actually kind of find pantries near you. And so it's just a great kind of interactive tool 
for you to really hone in and find that help near you. But we always encourage everybody, if you need additional help, or you know not everybody has access to the internet, we encourage everybody to call our offices at 888-704-FOOD, and we have staff who are more than happy to help anybody find that help that they need. And then obviously, we always, always appreciate everybody's help. If you would like to get involved with our mission, whether it's through, you know, time or donating food or donating financial gifts, they're greatly appreciated and most critical for our mission to continue. And so we just encourage you to also visit our website and we'll have links about how you can get involved. The same number will work if you want to call our offices. Um, we'll get you in touch with the right person. So please reach out to us. We'd love to get you involved. And then we'll have, as Michael mentioned, our third segment coming up in the month um, that will focus on our SNAP benefits program. So stay tuned. You will receive an email pretty shortly with um, a recording of this, we have a small survey just trying to get some feedback about some upcoming webinars and what you're interested in. And then in the essence of time, we may not be able to get to your question today, but we encourage you that if we don't, or if you have a question after this, to please put it in that survey and we will work very hard to get you connected to the right individual and get you an answer. So thank you again for joining us today. We're gonna kind of segue into this Q&A time. I'm going to quit sharing my screen so that we can have everybody big and bold. Um, so like I said, just go ahead and put your question in. All right. So one question for you, Michael, is are you currently only serving areas that have been impacted by Hurricane Sally or is the entire service area still being addressed? Yes, uh, that's something we, we keep a close eye on. We have 24 counties that we service, and uh, though the need may be great in particular areas due to disaster or some other event, uh, we have a responsibility to all the counties and all those folks in those counties in need to continue to support them. Uh, so we monitor that carefully. Uh, we, we look at our food supply, we look at our resources, whether that be uh, the, the people pulling the orders or the drivers, uh, and we want to make sure that we're staying balanced, as balanced as possible. Uh, I just reviewed the numbers uh, recently, and I know uh, they are in our Florida branch, and they are here as well in the operations departments to make sure that we're doing that. In addition to that, our agency relations departments are continuing uh, to communicate with all agents, and uh, we're trying to make sure that we get all the orders that, uh, that they need out to them. Uh, so anyway, the short answer to that is, yes, we're trying to... Uh, to be very deliberate about the fact that we don't neglect uh, anyone else. Eugenie, this question is for you. How are children that are attending school virtually, virtually this year still able to um, participate in the backpack program or any program that could help them? So uh, as as with the pandemic, we've had to get a little creative uh, with our, our strong partnerships we have with our schools and school counselors. What we've done is, is been able to work with them and be a little bit more hands on so they can set up uh, distribution times uh, at their schools so that families um, that would normally physically be there, school students that would physically be there, uh, they can come, you know, on, on Friday at, at, you know, say like one to two or, or two to three and they can pick up their backpack so they still have access to that food. Also, what was your biggest challenge switching between the programs when the pandemic hit? Let me get started. <laughs> so, let me get my list out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I think one of the, a couple of the biggest ones, um, I think safety, because especially in March, we didn't know as much about the virus as we do now, you know, we didn't know much about the pandemic. Um, and I think, you know, we have staff going in and out every day, our drivers going in and out every day. So we really wanted to prioritize keeping our, our, our drivers safe, um, making sure the meals we're prepping here um, and the meals that we work with a vendor to prep that, that they're being really safe with their meals um, because we don't want anyone to get sick. So that was, that was a big concern. Um, also just in the office, right? We, we have people moving around the office during the summer. Our, our staff nearly doubles because um, the program, you know, we are serving a lot more uh, kids. So we, 
we have to add add staff and we want to make sure even though we're adding staff we're also being safe about it um some other things i know one of the 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 fun things i <laughs> i had to do was was be flexible with our menu um as y'all saw with the toilet paper and <laughs> situation you know we had similar situations with food so we had to make sure that whenever we're we're purchasing food that um, we can get it in a timely manner. Um, a lot of our vendors went from, you know, being able to get food to us in a two week period to almost, you know, a, a six to eight week period. So that, that's a huge burden. Um, and so we had to learn how to, how to quickly change things and, and what can we get faster uh, and change up our menus that are also many requirements to make sure we're still getting food out to kids in need. And, and, and not only have the lead times exploded, and this is a, uh, has an impact on everything we do, challenge and everything else, but the price mm -hmm. uh, tripled, quadrupled. So we may spend 30 cents on a pound on a particular item. We could spend $1.20 now. Uh, so uh, the costs and the lead times have, have, have exploded. And in addition to that, uh, some of the, the, the food that we would get through the government, um, the, the supplements, what we do, the, those contracts aren't being filled. So a lot of those orders are canceled. So Food supply is a concern that we are, you know, constantly working with, uh, whether it be the lead times, availability, or, or just the price. So. All right, and our final question for today: If there are churches or nonprofits that would like to get involved with serving during the holiday season, or even um, helping out be a child nutrition site, how can they get involved? Um, well, they can contract uh, contact our agency relations department, so they could uh, they could go on our website here. Um, they can also call, uh, but someone uh, should be able to steer them in the right direction. We 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 love the the, the help, and, and if they're looking to help us on a volunteer basis, uh, you know, we have a department and, and folks ready to, to to work with them to help plug them into to many different opportunities. And some of them are, you know, it's uh, not only is it really satisfying personally to be able to help and give, but uh, some of them are just fun. So uh, hopefully we, we can, we, you can do two things at once, help somebody and, and have some fun along the way. And I, and, I, and I really encourage anybody that's thinking about that, whether it be at, at more of an agency that, that's looking to, to plug into something or individuals that want to do something, or maybe you have a group of friends that say, hey, let's, how can we get out there and do something? Uh, I, I think we have opportunities that you might find satisfying. Great. Well, I thank you both for your time today, and I thank everybody for tuning in. That's all the time we have. Um, stay tuned for that email, and on our social media site, we'll be sending out some more information about upcoming webinars. And as always, we hope you have a wonderful thank day. Thank, thank you, guys. You.